Okay. This Shabbat, we conclude with the two final parshiot in the book of Numbers, in the book of Bamidbar, which are Matos and Masen. And what we, we then, that brings us up to the final 37 days of Moshe's life and the book of Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy, which is the speech that Moshe gives continuously, practically for the last 37 days of his life is like parting remarks to the Jewish people. So that's what we're up to in the narrative. Um, what I wanted to also connect this to is that we are in the midst of the three weeks, which are weeks from the 17th of Tammuz until the 9th of Av, in which we have certain customs of mourning, and during which time we, we give a lot of thought to the destruction of the temple and what that means for us. So I think this is an interesting um, connection of timing for us to look like. And the thought of wrapping up the wilderness or the time in the wilderness for the Jewish people is also attached to a final discussion we had last week and which really went on after the class was offline, which had to do with the concept that Yehoshua, that Joshua in accepting upon himself to become Moshe's successor, he, when Moshe asked him, is there anything I can clarify for you? That's the last source we did. He seemed to say, no, I'm in good shape. And that caused a breach in the smoothness of the transition of the tradition from Moshe to Yeshua. It says that 300 laws were forgotten and 700 laws became doubtful because of the attitude that Yeshua, for to some slight, slight extent, evidenced by not saying to Moshe, of course, I wish I could have you as my teacher forever. Um, but at this point, I think we'll be okay, which, which, which I think would have been enough of a, an admission on his part that the transition from one generation to the next of Torah life distances us from the actual standing at Mount Sinai and represents a weakening of our connection to God. So I want to just look at these confluence of ideas together and start with going back to what we began the book of Bamidbor, the book of Numbers with. And that's this quote from Jeremiah chapter two, sentence two, it's, the, it's above the first source, where God says wistfully in the prophecy to Jeremiah, I remember the kindness of your youth. You, you are following me in the wilderness in a land not sown. So we're this week in reading Matot and Masse, we're concluding the 40 year period, which goes from the Jewish people leaving Egypt, standing at Mount Sinai, wandering through the wilderness. And then the fifth book of the Torah will be those 37 days of a departing speech given by Moshe, given by Moshe to the Jewish people. It includes mitzvot, it includes instructions, but most of all, it includes like a, an effort to convey forever through history, the continuity of, 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 of the mission of the Jewish people. So that's what we're up to. Let's set the stage for source number one. Now it, it, it's in the um, stone Chumash with the second of the two Torah readings we read, which is called Masse. And the word Masse means journeys. And um, I have a running quote here, but you'll find it on page 918.19 in the Stone Chumash. <laughs> what I highlighted here is Vayichtov Moshe Motso Ehem Ramasehem Api Hashem. And Moshe wrote down their goings out and their journeys, which were all done, Alpi Hashem, were all done according to God's word, which is really the. Um, Second sentence here. But just to give us a taste of it, these are the journeys of the children of Israel came out from the land of Egypt. They traveled from Ramses, Sukkot, Etam, Piachirot, Mora, Elim. And I think the total is, um, if I'm not mistaken, 48 places of sojourning, not all of which were even listed in the Torah until now. 
So a big question here is that why did Moshe repeat to the Jewish people a, an accounting of all of these final places that they had gone as we're wrapping up the book of the Midbar, the book of Numbers? And Rashi gives two explanations, and we're going to focus in on the second of them. So as it says in the source sheet, Rashi, a second explanation to, to understand why Moshe would list, spend, spent a whole chapter listing through all these different places. And in some places, it becomes very perfunctory. You know, they journeyed from Avot, and they encamped in the ruins at the border of, Mo of Moab, they journeyed from the ruins and encamped in Debot God. They journeyed from Debot God and they encamped at Almon Debrayot. So you can see where the nature of the recounting of the journey is lacking any detail or specificity. And it's literally like, you know, running through an itinerary and saying, oh, yeah, we were in Greece and we were in Italy and we were in Switzerland and we were in England and now we're back home. What's the value of that? So Rashi gives a second explanation by way of a parable. And this is a very eye-opening, surprising parable. It may be compared to the case of a king whose son was ill and whom he took to a distant place to cure him. When they returned home, the father began to enumerate all the stages, saying to him, to the child, here we rested which the Gori says means we were at peace. Here we were cold, meaning you felt you were lacking something. Here you had a headache, you were in danger. And the Midrash and Chuma says that's the nature of this listing. Now, is this surprising to us or not? First of all, if you look at the narrative the way we've gone through it forward and not backwards the way the king is doing it now, I would give you a completely different narrative. God rescued the Jewish people from Egypt. He rushed them out. He brought them seven weeks later to Mount Sinai. Splitting of the sea happened in the middle. He presented the Ten Commandments and elevated the people. And then God's idea was, let's go. Let's go to the land of Israel. And the Jewish people messed up and had doubts and delays and causes. And finally, with the sin of the spies, they were, it was decreed upon them that they would wander around for 40 years before they go inside. So in a certain sense, you might expect the father to say, well, we finally are where we were supposed to be 39 and a half years ago, <laughs> if not for the fact that you have been such a total pain in the neck. It's sort of the way we feel if you've ever taken a trip with your kids when they're very little and you realize that, you know, it said on the GPS it was supposed to take five hours to get there, but we had to stop to the bathroom 14 times. <laughs> and this kid was throwing a tantrum and this kid was in a fight. And the other thing happened, and we therefore it took us 40, 40 hours instead of five. That sort of would be the way we would do it prospectively. But retrospectively, what Rashi is saying here, according to this Medrash Tanhum, and it is repeated again in the Medrash Rabbah also, a very similar version, that God's attitude was not like that. So could anybody explain what's going on here? You know, what is God's recollection of these 40 years? What is it, how does it color our understanding of the whole book we're about to complete and we're about to finish? Anybody want to? Make a suggestion. Well, that emphasizing details because of that, how the camp cared for us, helped us move along throughout all the different So, by emphasizing details, you mean about, or maybe by mentioning each and every place. Right. But why is that extremely annoying? You know, like, I'll think about my trip. We stopped at this rest stop. Because you had a, you were you needed to use the restroom. And then we got back in the car and we started to go, but then the other kid decided they needed to go to the restroom. So we backed up on the ramp and we spent it, we were there again. And then we started to go again, and lo and behold, we couldn't even get onto the freeway when we had to stop a third time. That's really what the narrative breaks down to being, because after all, it was meant in a certain conceptual frame to be a straight, short 
journey. Now, not the shortest possible journey, because we remember in the book of Exodus, it says they could have gone straight up the coast of the Mediterranean, but God said, no, that was not a good idea because the police team, the Philistines were there and the people would get afraid and they would run back. So clearly there needed to be some development, you know, sort of like uh, thinking about Dunkirk, you know, we got to pull the troops back and we have to train them for a while before they're really ready to, to carry out their mission. But clearly it was nowhere in shape or form to be this place and this place and all the wanderings. And if you look at maps and they do have maps in the back of here, you know, I mean, they're really wandering, you know, I mean, it really, there are even times where the people accuse Moshe of, you know, like, like you know, are you lost, you know, so. Well, I think also, Rabbi, that uh, it's pretty impressive as they camped, they had all, obviously a lot of people uh, uh, at that at one time having to encamp and you've got to set up the the tent and you've got to set up you know the the ark and you know i mean it's it's uh um it shows how much effort was put into this and how what commitment there was so in a way that's the sentence in jeremiah and that's why i put it on the top now the overarching thing is wow you 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 know, you had the courage and the faith and the trust to follow God into the wilderness, and by the way, you know the manna fell from heaven and the clouds of glory kept you comfortable and and a few million people survived in the, in a totally uninhabitable place. That's sort of really what it says in Jeremiah, but that's not what it says. Is we were here and then we were here, we were here and then we were here, we were here, we then we were here. Now you know, and and by the way. There are other Midrashim or commentaries that say this is a way of reminding us of our misbehaviors and motion in a very subtle, dignified way is basically saying, boy, this was a rough trip. But this Midrash Tanchuma, repeated in the Midrash Rapa, where I wanted to just highlight it, it seems to me it's like all God knows is we have arrived. We made it. And in the process of making it, look who you have become. And that's that idea, you were ill. That's the parable after all. So I'm, God is the king. We, the Jewish people are the prince, the son of the king. And we, you know, we started on a journey and, and really we started on the journey because we were in very bad shape. And the purpose of the journey, that's sort of what's included in this parable was that we should develop to become who we are at this moment. So it really, you know, it, it strikes me so much as a celebration. Look, in a certain way, God saying, look who you have become. Look at all that we have been through. Look at all the stages and steps of progress that we have made. People don't very often look at their life this way in detail. It's much easier to just take the sentence of Jeremiah and say, wow, what a period of time. But when, when you say, but there was this stuff and this stuff, there was this headache, and there was this moment when you felt lacking. And then there were these places where we camped and there was peace and there was harmony and there was, you know, we were able to commune together and, 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 and connect. And then we moved on to another place and there was another problem. But, but you can only say this in a good natured way if you're so focused on look what the outcome has been. Look where we have arrived. So that's like a, a, an idea I wanted to um, put forward. And I will tell you that my thinking here is colored by a book I finished reading recently. It's called The Rabbi of 84th Street. It's a short, not heavy duty book. It's about a man named Rabbi Besser, Haskell Besser. And I'll just give you one quick thumbnail. He, he was a person born in a German speaking Polish community um, in 1923. His family right at Kristallnacht left immediately and went to Palestine. He joined his family, he was only 16 at the time, but he, he, he was left behind to wrap up their business interests and take care of things. And he had a very difficult time, but he made it to Palestine himself. In 1952, he had some health issues, decided to come to America, loved America, decided to raise his family in America, moved in on the Upper West Side. That's the 84th Street connection in Manhattan. 
and he lived out his life as a Hasidic man and left a few generations of children or grandchildren, financial success. And, and, he, and in the book, there's a lot of reflecting on his life. And, and in a way, if you think about it, what did he see in his life? As a young child, he saw that because he, he was a Hasidic young man who, you know, he, he was known in New York as the Hasid who loved going to the opera and the symphony because he came from a very, very cultured German family also. Hasidic and cultured don't often get put in the same sentence, but that was the case with him. But, you know, he had, he had a sense of when he reminisced about his life, about that, yes, I saw so much rebuilt, but of course, in the end, it didn't come up to the standard of the gloriness, of the glory and the greatness that I saw when I was growing up. And that was his, but he, he was a happy person. He was very involved. He was the international chairman of the Dafyomi for a few years because he really believed in getting people to study Talmud and to learn together and to grow together, things that weren't so obvious to people who came to America in 1952 and built a life here. But there was this, this sense, like I'm saying here, of a lot of difficulties. The whole world that he was born into was gone forever. And yet he saw a, an echo of it rebuilt in his lifetime, and he felt very satisfied and very thankful that he played a small role in doing that. So it's sort of like this mixed bag, but one that can give a person tremendous happiness and contentment. That he didn't he didn't pass away, and he did pass away in I think 2010, whatever age that would make him born in 1923. Um, he was about 84 years old, I think 83 years old. But but in other words, he 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 left this world a very content person, and yet a person who realized that there'd been much travail and much turmoil and much destruction that took place in the course of his lifetime. And it sort of evokes to me what this comment of Rashi does. In other words, here we are, we the Jewish people, we've arrived at the banks of the Jordan River under the leadership of Moshe. We've certainly had our ups and downs, but every difficulty has contributed to who we are today. And that's sort of the perspective I want to take. Now, I, I saw the Rosh Hashim, if anybody has a question, I saw the Rosh Hashim of Chavitayim quoted from the, uh, Rabbeinu Mibar Tanura, the following commentary on this. In Egypt, and this was his take on it, we became sick through involvement in idolatry and immorality. Hashem brought us to Mount Sinai, presented us with the Torah, and through the 40 years in the wilderness as a healing process, now about to enter the land and to return to the lofty levels of our patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who enjoyed experiencing the presence of Hashem, which was revealed amongst them. It is a time to recount and reminisce. And that's sort of the tone that I take away from this. And, and, I, and I'm reading that into his tag on to, to, to the Rashi, quoting the Medrash. Now, the Rashiva of Chavetz Chaim, Rabbi Leibowitz asked a question in this discussion of these, these sources and says, the Talmud teaches that a person is never allowed to remind a Baal Teshuva of their past in, in, in any kind of a negative way. And the Gemara gives examples like a um, person's not allowed to say, you know, um, oh, I remember when you used to eat so-and-so or something like that. And the Rashiva in just clarifying why, why this would fit into the Torah here, you know, just the idea that if the reason is to express joy of achievement, and that's what he pulls out of this, or and or, if it's to take stock of the magnitude of the progress that the people have achieved, that for those purposes, that that's not what the Talmud is talking about avoiding mentioning. And, and so we, we see here that there's a certain sense of importance of us taking stock of our lives in a way that celebrates that which legitimately should be celebrated, which is whatever achievement we have. Now, a little bit, I mean, I find this not a perfect fit because the Medrash really takes the position of the king. And if you think about it from the king's viewpoint, the king's prompting for this whole trip was because my kid is sick. 
But that's what the Bartanura adds. So in other words, you know, you are my children, God is saying. And I sent you down to Egypt for a purpose that you should be galvanized into a people. And so I could take you out of there and give you the Torah. But in the course of you being there, you became involved in idolatry. You saw and were impacted by lives of immorality. So that ne that that needed to be cured also from you. And the experience of going out from Egypt itself was not the cure. And the experience of standing at Mount Sinai and receiving the Torah, that was not the cure. It required us to travel around seeking a cure. That, that's what I get from this is that every step along the way was important. Mm -hmm. And instead of summarizing it by, well, we had the splitting of the sea, we had the golden calf, we had just a few incidents. This, this seems to say that every step along the way was important. Good. Okay. You know, in a certain sense, that idea, I mean, there are no shortcuts in life, in a way. Uh -huh. In other words, in other words if there were. If we would have missed any one of these places, then we wouldn't be who we are today. That's an important insight too. I think that's an addition that could be a third point to be taken from this, in addition to the idea of, of, of you know recognizing growth and and taking stock of the magnitude of the growth, and then I guess also understanding how every life experience is essential. And see this, all these attitudes taken together create a sense of traveling on a journey with God by your side, which which really is is the import of how we're to understand our experience. And, and I find myself telling people more and more these days, you know, people have to live their lives. And I don't say that with harshness or without any sense of wanting to help someone. But you know, we seem to have an attitude today that the job of the world is to remove any impediment to make life perfect for everybody. You know, if, if my two kids don't get along with each other, so I should buy two computers and two TVs, I have two playrooms, and of course I have separate bedrooms so that I can pave the way for them just to have a nice, happy childhood. Perhaps instead of saying, look, learning to get along with another person is a really important skill. And maybe if, if we only stay with the one TV, and they'll learn to negotiate and get along with each other and decide that now you'll watch what you want and then tomorrow I'll watch what I want. That might be more enriching to them than simply spending their childhood each one watching what they want to watch <laughs> when they want to watch it, which is our tendency, our overwhelming tendency nowadays. You know, now when someone has a difficult, I mean, I just saw an interesting thought from Rabbi Torsky, Abraham Torsky should rest in peace. He gave the example. I hope I have it right, but, but of a shellfish, I think he was talking about a lobster, but I'm not sure, that literally outgrows its shell and feels a lot of distress. And that distress leads the, the whatever the right animal is, I think it's a lobster, to like crawl under a rock and with pain shed its shell and then grow another shell. And it does that several times during the course of its life. And as he jokingly said, you know, it was it was now in 2021, the mother lobster would be saying, oh, don't worry, you don't have to grow. It's okay, just stay the way you are. You don't have to go through this. Here's uh, some, as he put it, here's some Valium to take, you know, just relax. You know, you'll live with the shell you've got. Why should you have to go through anything as traumatic as all that? And, and I'll take care of you forever. And he was just pointing out the fact that, 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 you know, that that's not living a life. So I guess that's relevant to your point. Um, of course, the nice thing about the book of Bamidbar is that the Jewish people conclude ready to go into the land of Israel. And, um, you know, under, and again, it's a bittersweet thing because Moshe is not going to go in for that with them and everything else. But, but it, it ends up just, it doesn't end up as dramatically as does the book of Bayikra, which just, it just ends, these are the commandments and the ordinance that Hashem commanded through Moshe, the children of Israel on the plains of Moab at the Jordan by Jericho. So this ends that section of the Torah. But I wanted to, in source number two here, look at a perspective on the three weeks themselves. Because this is also a mixed bag for us. And it's a time that's not the simplest of times for, for, for us to understand. And this touches upon the discussion we had last week at the end, which had to do with this view of generations declining. 
So um, the first source in under source two, the first quote I have here is a very seminal quote. It's from the book of Hosea, a prophecy that you're probably not too familiar with. I certainly am not familiar with it. And the sentence reads like grapes in the wilderness. You know, I quote the folklore as I found Israel as pleasing as grapes in the wilderness. Your father seemed to me like the first fig to ripen on a fig tree. That's the, that's the vision that Hosea had. And of course, since he talks about the wilderness that connects it to the book of Bamidbar with the book of Numbers, which is the book of the Jewish people building in the wilderness. And so the, the comment is like grapes in the wilderness while dwelling in the wilderness, I found Israel meaning, and here's where it adds this definition of what does Israel mean? Am in Hebrew, it's Ele Shara Kel, a nation that perceives Hashem. So from this perspective, from the prophecy of Hosea, we're finishing a book where the Jewish people spent 40 years in intimate contact with God, where they came to perceive God throughout their lives. And you would almost think, of course, because after all the food they ate was manna that fell from heaven. They were surrounded by miracles. The water they drank up until the very last year when Miriam died came out of a rock in her merit. Um, the clouds of glory were over them in Aaron's merit. They saw as each of these people died, those things left them. So they, they experienced God up close in a very unusual way. And now they're at the verge of entering the land of Israel where they would end up each man under his fig tree, as it says, and, and needing to continue to perceive God within a much more natural, ordinary agricultural existence, fulfilling the Torah. So it would be a big stage change. So this is where this, the Rebbe of Rishness, and this is purely Hasidic Torah that my wife has a whole development on, but I just wanted to give a few highlights of what these stages look like. So, um, okay. So what the Rebbe of Rishness says is that human beings are made up of three distinct parts. And he's gonna go through them as allegories for the, the, the stages of, of life of the Jewish people. There's the head, there's the trunk of your body, and there's your legs and feet, okay? And by the way, he, he does this with immense number of references to the Torah. And specifically, when we get into the book of Deuteronomy, we're gonna see that the, the um, third parsha is called Akev, which means the heel or on the heels of. So this is where this analogy is, it comes from. But it comes from the use of the word Akev throughout the Torah. The name Yaakov includes the word Akev because Jacob was holding onto the heel of his brother Esau. Let's just look at this as a, as a conceptual piece. So he says the early generations, these generations that went out of Egypt and that experienced the wilderness, they were like a head. What do we know is concentrated in our heads? Our heads is our whole sense of seeing hearing, intellectual processing, all that takes place in our head. So hence, you, it, it's related to this quote from the book of Hosea, that, that we, were, we were originally a nation that perceived Shero'a Kale. We, we saw God. He was a presence to us. He was, he was clear to us. And that's using our head, so to speak. It says over time, as that high level of attachment dissipated, the middle generations are like the trunk of your body. What's in the trunk of your body? Your heart and your kidneys. We'll just talk about two of the key organs. Your heart, because there's the feelings and the ability to have a wholehearted relationship with God is there. And the kidneys, just in the sense of filtering your experiences and justifying Hashem's guidance, there's, this enables, uh, it enabled the Jewish people, and I don't know exactly when one period begins and one period ends, but let's say in rough terms, you know, in other words, the two temples would represent the times when, when we were whole, and therefore the seat of our connection to God was in our head, was through our senses, our hearing, seeing, smelling, 
our intellectual attachment. After the destruction of the temple, let's say all the way through, let's say till the Middle Ages or beyond that, we, we had the ability to have the, the heart and the kidneys, we had the ability to have deep feelings of connection and our bodies were remaining connected to God. It says now we're at a period of time of Akef. And, and the word Akef, by the way, it also refers to an idea of Ikvisa de Meshicha, which really means the epoch of Moshiach. But again, it uses that same word Akef, like on the heels or on the threshold of Moshiach coming. So it said at this time, <coughs> all those things have dissipated. We're, so what are we clinging to? We're clinging to two things, a sense of faith and a sense of regard and appreciation of those who have come before us. And those who have come before us, I wanna say specifically, means those individuals who link us back to these earlier periods of time. And here I could point to Rabbi Besser, I would point to something else, which is a talk that Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik gave this year about Menachem Begin, and about Menachem Begin stressing about himself. He said one of the key elements of his life is that he felt he carried the all the yoke of all the Jewish people who had come before him. And in a, in a, in a very interesting way, Rabbi Soloveitchik was explaining that, that unlike other Zionist Jewish leaders, Menachem Begin didn't see the founding of the present state of Israel as a break with the past, as a new Jew coming on the horizon, but he saw it as a fulfillment of the dreams and hopes and aspirations and greatness of the people that came before him. And in Hebrew, I have a quote on my refrigerator from him, which I bought at the Begin Museum, where he said, and I'll say it in Hebrew and then I'll explain it. Lo b'schut ha'koach, ela b'koach ha'schut, which means translate, it's not in the merit of our strength, but it's rather in the strength of our merit. That's his phrase. So in other words, he saw the founding of the modern state of Israel and, and, and the return to the land of Israel, not as us defying the, the past generations of suffering, of the Holocaust, of, of, of the, the proverbial ghetto Jew that we were shedding that shell and leaving it behind, and we were rather creating a brand new being in the new Jew who's ready to fight and to strive and to be at one with all of mankind, which we've seen how profoundly that that's not fulfilled in spite of all those other abilities. But he saw it rather as this is the echo of the greatness of the generations that have come before him, us. And I think that's also a big commentary on this biography of this Rabbi Haskell Besser that I read. In other words, he saw so much disappear forever in his lifetime. And yet he felt as though, but, but look, look how, and, and I, I'm saying this in a very um, serious way, look how bright the lights are from the fumes that remain. You know, this thing in auto racing, you know, he's running on fumes. You know, in a certain sense, I think what the Rebbe's, what the original Rebbe said, we're running on fumes, but those fumes are what remain from these generations before that had such a full blown dynamic, complete immersion and understanding of the greatness of the Jewish people and the privilege it is to be the nation that bears the legacy of the Torah and that represents this interest of morality in the world. And yes, we may only have fumes left in the tank compared to what previous generations had, but look how far those fumes are taking us. They're gonna take us across the finish line 
and the checkered, and we're going to see the checkered flag waved at us as we somehow make it across. And I think that that's also an allegory that that we should think about a lot as we go through this period of the three weeks and we think about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, as we think about the turmoil of the Jewish people through the Holocaust, our opportunity to rebuild and build the land of Israel and occupy Israel as we have today, but not as that being us in spite of our past, but rather because we're able to hold on, just like Rabbi Salvation describes the attitude of Menachem Begin, hold on to that greatness of the past, you know. That's the, the notion that I wanted to say is similar to the comment of Rashi on this Medrash as we complete the book, as we complete the fourth book of the Torah of Bramidbar. And it says here on the source sheet is our determination to cling to what has gone before us. And what I would say is, and to cherish that which remains from what has gone before us knowing that Hashem remains attached to us, because after all, that's that original Rashi, that rather than thinking, boy, I've had a rough go with this recalcitrant son of mine, but rather celebrating the fact that we have arrived. And this carries forward our bond to Hashem. As the Rebbe of Rishna says, our holding on is a tremendous source of nachas, of pleasure and contentment to God just as in a way our arriving at the banks of the Jordan River after 40 years in the wilderness positioned us to evoke the sense of God reminiscing about the wonderful achievement that the 40 years in the wilderness was. So too, in a sense, we're poised to feel the same way about the 2000 year exile of the Jewish people and in, in, in our ability to hold on to what we could hold on to and our ability to celebrate it and our ability to wait so that it could be, it could, it could come to fruition in our lifetimes as well. As well. I think in that sense, going through the three weeks, it's a time of mourning, it's a time when we don't shave or as, you, as we usually do, we don't celebrate weddings. We don't, we don't distract ourselves from the seriousness of the time. But it's a time to reflect upon the fact that, wow, we have, this is what we need to yearn for the return to as we continue to draw waters of life from these very last remaining drops of the well, so to speak. And I think in that sense, we could make the most of our time during these three weeks in terms of reading the prophecies and thinking about how we might do better to reconnect with God and thinking about how we might treat each other better and in thinking about the fact that we can make it to the finish line with the determination that we can muster within ourselves in spite of what has already been lost from the past. Any questions? All right, so thank everybody for participating. And we please God, it should be a meaningful two and a half weeks left as we lead up our, lead up to Tisha B'Av. And uh, next week we'll begin the, um, the fifth and final book of the Torah, the book of Devarim.